Um, we consider uh, Laura Phipps one of our own, as she has a, a BFA in Studio Art and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from TCU. And she worked in the Curatorial Department and Director's Office here at the Modern before going on to Hunter College uh, SUNY for her MA in Art History. Laura began at the Whitney soon after, so you know she's special because she landed such a great job, and has assisted with numerous exhibitions, including the 2010 Whitney Biennial. And I'm not going to go into all else, but um, she's, she's made her mark. So now, as associate curator, her recent projects have included Around Days in Downtown New York City, 1970 to 1985, Virginia Overton Sculpture Gardens, Open Plan, Andrea Frazier, Andrea Frazier, and um, the group show of emerging artists um, titled Flatlands. She has also served on uh, the grant selection committee of the Rima Hort Mann Foundation as a visiting critic. Um, she's as a visiting critic for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council workshop and um, Smack, Mellon, Smack Mellon Studio Program and as a guest curator at the uh, Kentler Drawing Center, Brooklyn. But of course, it is her conception and organization of Jean Quick to See Smith memory map that has brought her back to Fort Worth. Jean Quick to See Smith is an important artist. Um, I'm going to say elder, but she can correct that if I'm wrong on that. Activist, teacher, curator and an advocate for indigenous art and fellow indigenous artists. While she is a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kuntani Nation of Montana, Jean also grew up on several other reservations in, in the Pacific Northwest. She went on to receive a BA in art education from the Farmingham um, State University in Massachusetts her MA in Visual Arts from the University of New Mexico, and notably has been awarded honorary doctorates from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Massachusetts College of Art, the University, and the University of New Mexico. Over the course of um, a 50-year career, John work, John's work has been featured in hundreds of exhibitions across the U.S. and Europe. In addition, she has made curating part of her practice, curating significant exhibitions throughout her career. Most recently, she curated The Land Carries Our Ancestors, Contemporary Art by Native Americans, a massive undertaking um, as um, it uh, highlights artworks from some 50 living Native artists that along with the demands of her own exhibition at the Whitney that is now here, opened at the National Gallery of Art in September and runs through January 15, 2024. All to say, Jean is a major player, and Laura it was brilliant to showcase her work in the exhibition that is currently being installed across the second floor of this museum. And we have the great honor of hearing from them both this evening. So if you would, please join me in a warm welcome of Laura Phipps and Jean Quick to see Smith. Thank you, Terry, so much for that beautiful introduction. You stole almost everything I was going to say. So, <laughs> um, but I will reintroduce myself. I'm Laura Phipps, an associate curator at the Whitney, um, a settler, and tonight and this week, a very grateful guest on the ancestral homelands of the Wichita and affiliated tribes, among many others. Um, I'm particularly thrilled to be here tonight, and honestly, it's very surreal. Uh, because as an undergrad at TCU, um, when this building was brand new, uh, many years ago, I can remember sitting in the audience for many Tuesday evening lectures, uh, thinking of actually just like right here, Michael Opping trying to like draw answers out of Carl Andre. <laughs> um, luckily, I don't, I don't think that's going to be an issue tonight. Um, 
And it's all the more special to be here with Jean, an artist uh, in a place that is so near to my heart with an artist that is also so near to my heart. So I'll keep this introduction brief so we can get right into it. But um, the occasion for us being here is, of course, the opening of the retrospective Jean Quick to see Smith memory map just across the lobby on the second floor later this week. Um, I hope you all will come back and see it um, Sunday, or if you become members, you can come earlier. Um, it was first presented uh, opening last April at the Whitney in New York. Um, as Terry sort of alluded to, the show is the largest and most comprehensive um, exhibition of Jean's work to date. It includes about 130 works um, and really is the full range of um, Jean's artistic practice, paintings, drawings, sculptures, prints, ephemera, um, starting from 1974 all the way until works that were made just uh, within the last few years. So what I really want to reiterate is something that Terry said to um, or pointed to, which is really the, the capacious and inclusive nature of Jean's practice. Um, Jean is, again, an artist, an educator, a curator, an activist, and um, truly an advocate for generations now of indigenous artists and um, Seeing the, um, that expanded practice has been one of the most amazing things about working um, with Jean. Um, it is also one of the reasons that the exhibition is organized the way that it is, um, which you will see. We, um, we used chronology when it was helpful. So sort of at the beginning of the show, maybe thinking about the building blocks of her career, but then we really let the the themes that are important to Jean, the um, visual cues that sort of repeat and circle back um, over and over throughout the career. We really let those sort of lead the exhibition. Um, we started working on this show nearly five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it has been, um, it's a product of um, years of research, um, years of deep detective work, um, and really meaningful conversations and very close looking. Um, just to get back to also what Terry said, Jean is a, what do you want to say? We traveled together, and remember? we traveled together. Yeah. yeah, it was 2019, how many years ago is that? Yeah, <laughs> we did that about four years ago, maybe? Four years ago, so yeah. we've been to some of the most important <laughs> places mm -hmm. uh, to Jean together as well, mm -hmm. including in uh, time spent in her studio, and all of this is, Important to note because uh, this is what building an exhibition has been. It's building relationship. Um, it's uh, being in community with each other and with many, many others. And so I actually thought this was maybe a good place to start. As Terry mentioned, Jean is a citizen of the oh, deep research. <laughs> many, many, many dives into bibliographies, um, boxes of archives, um, some of the earliest works discovered in storage. <laughs> Um, Jean is a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation in Montana, which is where she was born, but also, as Terry mentioned, uh, spent a lot of uh, time in the Pacific Northwest, which we visited together, and mm -hmm. since 1976 has lived in Corrales, New Mexico. And I, I thought this was maybe a good place to start, Jean, in thinking about um, all of our conversations from the very beginning about land and place um, and the how centering those um, really brought through the most important themes in the show. And I, I maybe thought you would like to start thinking about um, how the places you have lived, the land that you belong to, um, has been important to your artistic identity and production. Hey, Laura, could you be sure that John's turned on? It is. It's turned on. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, Neil hooked it up, and John approved it, so. Did you bring your own mic? No, John gave it to us, yeah. Bless his heart, yeah. John, I'm just gonna flip I'm just gonna flip through some images, if that's sure. right? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Unless you wanna talk about this. Yeah, well, yeah. All about, yeah, everything is about land, um, abstract landscapes. Um, the robes were uh, kind of cut like out of shapes like animals, like at home. 
they do a lot of um, hide tanning at home, so I made the the unstretched canvases, uh, you know, like sort of shaped like hides. Um, yep, maybe to give some context, these works from yeah. 1977, the Ronin Robe series, are yeah. some of the very first works that Jean did after moving to New Mexico, and yeah. the. Um, Yep. The stories that you share about making these works have a lot to do with um, memory of home and, yep. and even homesickness. Yeah, uh, and um, at home when they, uh, women do the work, they scrape the hides and the hides are on a, a scaffold that they make standing up. And so when I was working on the paintings too in the studio and scraping the paint, and I was thinking about that, and at the same time, um, I was curating an exhibition of Native women, about 24, it was the first traveling exhibition of Native women in this country. And, um, and, and as I interviewed each of the women, they were all talking about something that happened on the reservation or in their community, or they saw their mother or their grandmother doing, and it had a relationship to the art they were making. And so mine was like, I was using the paint like hide tanning, and then I did that same thing on these unstretched canvases, not totally aware of what I was doing at that time, but in retrospect, you know, then I sort of discovered it that way. I don't think I had heard you talk about it that way. One of the other ways that you've talked about these works in particular is is what you were learning um, from professors at the time, like Harmony Hammonds or Joyce Kozloff, who had these um, uh, sort of uh, short-term professorships at the University of New Mexico. And so uh, sort of learning from these feminist artists based in New York, the sort of strategies of um, thinking about pulling the canvas off the wall, thinking about how it is that you bring maybe some of your own um, personal identity into work. Into well, they work. were, t you know, they were always talking about Anna Mendieta or um, uh, Eva Hesse, um, artists uh, who did work off the wall. And of course, Harmony did, and Jane Kaufman did as well. And so they encouraged the women to do that. Joyce Kozloff was teaching there at the same time time, and um, so during that feminist period, they were um, seeking another route to making art um, in feminist terms. And of course, then I became friends with uh, um, uh, Paul Brock and Miriam Shapiro, and of course, Miriam at that time was one of the leading feminists in the country, and she had influence too. So I should mention that all these install uh, images are from the Whitney, so don't be confused when you go upstairs eventually. It'll look a little bit different. Um, but these are a number of uh, works also from the same time that you were making, the Ronin Robes, the sort of early days of being in New Mexico and thinking about um, memories of landscape. And, and some of these works, I think, were really integral in thinking about um, even the title for the show, Memory Map, and the way it is that um, that land sort of becomes a part of who we are and um, how your memory was really shaped. I know that we spent a lot of time in picking the title and um, you know we went back and forth about this and that, something with red in it. Titles are hard. Something, yeah, but I think you know uh, in the end this was really the best title of all. Um, it's resonated long after the exhibition long after uh, we had that title for the exhibition. And um, I think it's really descriptive and it also has a resonance with the work. Um, there are some moments in the show where we really uh, attempted to make the connection between your <laughs> activist work and the work that was happening in your studio. And I was thinking specifically of works um, from this series, the Petroglyph Park series in the 80s, and even um, a number of the pastels that were shown for the first time in New York, uh, 
would you want to speak a little bit to maybe this particular moment of where these um, parts of your practice sort of came together, but maybe also your ideas around activism and the environment more There's, broadly? There was a man named Ike Eastfold in Albuquerque who um, became alarmed about the petroglyphs. Um, we've got 17 miles of escarpment that are covered um, uh, with petroglyphs um, that go back 5,000 years or longer. And some of the local tribes still go there to pray. And, um, and people have been using them uh, for target practice and shooting the petroglyphs and saying, you know, they're just childlike things. They're, they're not necessary. And um, so Bill Richardson had just um, been elected to the House in, in Congress. And so um, a group of us artists came together and we asked him if he could please make some legislation to stop, um, you know, destruction in, the, in this escarpment. And um, some of the um, gift shops in Old Town had chipped out or chiseled uh, images out of the rocks and sold them for yard art. So there was like all, all this destruction taking place. And um, he did, he, he got legislation and made it into a national park. And so part of m in my process was photographing um, the images which are in the exhibition, the old black and white photographs that I took, also hiking through that area. Um, and um, now it's against the law, you know, to destroy it. It's the only city in the United States which has, um, you know, this national park right next to the city with all of these old petroglyphs in it. And people come from all over the world to hike in this area. So I made a whole series of paintings and drawings um, uh, with about the Petroglyph Park. And I think about that particular moment and that specific sort of activism that had this um, concrete outcome uh, is maybe, um, doesn't happen every time, <laughs> no. it doesn't uh, always have those, and yet that same amount of sort of um, dedication and vigor is throughout your work and thinking about um, the environment and the ways in which you want your work to sort of speak to um, the potential for change, or the potential for protection, does that seem right? I think that's correct, and I also am a storyteller, so um, whatever research project I'm working on at the time. And there's always a lot of research, you know, before I do a series of work and then I launch into the work. So, um, it, you know, f certainly for Petroglyph Park, you know, there was a lot of um, research involved in that. Um, you know, the hiking and photographing and documenting what was going on uh, was all important to this work. So each body of work um, entails like uh, doing a lot of research in a variety of ways. I think one thing that will be interesting to see in this exhibition too is if I actually go back to some of the um, works, the newspaper clippings and the ways in which they really made their way specifically into your work and the stories that were being told. And I'm thinking of the courthouse steps and mm -hmm. um, you could probably tell the news story better, but the sort of specificity of taking a story that's in the news and sort of illustrating in this um, more abstract way, but then also the ways that you were saying that hiking through just sort of changed your maybe relationship to the space in your paintings, introduced um, some of these petroglyph forms differently mm -hmm. in your work. And I think that's interesting to think of in terms of research. Part of it was that I had been doing a lot of research on the plateau, and the plateau runs from um, Northern California up through Oregon, uh, Idaho, um, the western part of Montana, 
and then up into Canada. And that region has a lot of tribes. And um, there were a lot of cave paintings and uh, petroglyphs and pictographs. And, um, and I've collected a lot of books and also visited these sites as well. So I had already been doing that research. And then, um, on, and then also when this uh, project appeared, um, and I became involved with the artists. And in order to raise money for this, we had to donate artwork. So part of the artwork that you see here was donated to raise funds you know, for um, advertising the plight of the, this park, which became a park, and also encouraging the legislation, you know, writing letters, that kind of thing. So maybe moving on to, I was thinking about um, your use of really iconic imagery. Um, and there's a, a moment when maybe you start really specifically thinking about things like canoes and bison and flags and maps as these sort of central characters in your paintings. Um, and I was thinking about how the map really points, you know, directly to the aspects of your practice around land and history and art history and the, this maybe this um, approach to a map of the United States um, is a great place to sort of talk about how your interest and your, again, deep research and um, sort of uh, consummate study of art history and the stories that you want that you want to tell uh, sort of come together in paintings that use this imagery of the map of the United States. Well, I think you, I think when you enter the exhibition, you'll notice um, in the earlier work there's a lot of all overness, sort of map-like, um, and then references to to a map in an abstract way. And as you move through the exhibition. I think you would notice that it seems to coalesce into these larger images. Um, and the way you put it together, Laura, is really magical because you caught on to that early on. And when you, um, you know, I had noticed when I first saw the exhibition, the way you put it together tells a really interesting story about an artist and their life. And, um, so it starts out with, you know, um, with the pictographs and all overness, and then it seems to coalesce into larger images until, like some of the images, like the flags and things like that, become images all into the uh, unto themselves. So there's a kind of growth that takes place, I think, um, that you don't often see in a retrospective. Um, you know, I think when Garth entered the exhibition, uh, my dealer in New York, he talked about how uh, he came through and in each case there seemed to be kind of a level of, of, of whatever it was, like with the pictographs, and then you moved into these landscapes. They were um, maybe like expressionism, you know, some, some of the landscapes that were with the light bulbs and, you know, the, the chief Seattle landscapes. And then I think some of the, then the maps began to appear. And it was all kind of mapping, even from the very beginning. It's just that I was expressing it in different ways. And so um, I think that um, the maps just continued it's just imaginary in my head that I'm, that I'm creating maps. It's just not like the maps that we see until later. And I actually began to use maps like Jasper Johns. In fact, I got into trouble in New York from a major writer who said, how dare you use Jasper Johns maps? Or, um, yeah, so. Uh, they, you know, that that uh, that's what I learned in school that the white men owned 
the maps and the flags. <laughs> and I, I just wasn't quite aware of it until I created that faux pas, and then... Um, it didn't seem to stop you. Well, no. it did. It did temporarily, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I had to think about it. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He doesn't own that. He doesn't own that map. And then, of course, like at that time, we were moving slowly. Like we, could, like in 1992, I could not have said, um, "Land back." I could not have said, you know, "Land acknowledgement." I could not have said, I could not have said, "Stolen land." I was just talking about that when I was at the National Gallery with a group of natives there, that in those days, I could not have, have used those words. And I was doing it quietly in my own way, because when I was a little kid, my father said to me, um, sis, don't ever talk back to white people because um, you'll get in trouble if you do. You can think it in your head, but you can't. And I know for African American friends and also for Native friends who are my age, we received uh, messages like that from our parents that we would have to be careful. And now I see all these younger Native artists and African American artists, you know, just blurting stuff out. And so I think I was doing it in my own quiet way all through the 90s when I was making maps and I was cutting stuff out of the New York Times and putting these kind of, not rude, but provocative, you could say. Um, and it was like, I can't say it, but I can, I can cut it out of the New York Times and put it there. <laughs> and so, I, so you'll see when you enter the exhibition, the way Laura spaced everything out, you'll, you'll see my, my growth in my ability to just be a little bit more outspoken. That the United States was the first people's land. It, it, it was stolen from all of us. And then even, we still have land issues at home about Flathead Lake and who gets to use the water. And like on the reservation, my reservation is a checkerboard, which entered the show at the National Gallery. Um, it wasn't here, but it went into that exhibition, that whole issue of checkerboard land. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the um, way you got to sort of uh, using text and collage, because it really does enter your practice in the 90s. Right. Um, yeah. And there's one of the writers for the catalog, um, Richard Hill, who had this wonderful turn of phrase thinking mm -hmm. about your use of collage mm -hmm. in particular being the struggle for the surface and that right. there were these parallels with both the way that you were making work but also the way that you were you know putting yourself and other artists out there in the world and that in a way when you're using collage as a medium you're making decisions about what's important right. and in this work in particular which is the the first time that you used the, the sort of recognizable map of the United States in 1992, I know you have talked about when you've given tours that, you know, there's text and it's active text in every single state right. across the U.S., which is really to you an a acknowledgement, yeah, an acknowledgement yeah. of presence. Yes, it was. It was a political statement about there being Native Americans in in the whole country, everywhere. Even if there wasn't a reservation there, uh, Native Americans lived there and were doing activities there. So when I cut the articles out of the Charcusta, our reservation newspaper, and um, out of the New York Times and other newspapers, we used to have a store in Albuquerque called Newsland. And you could go and you could buy newspapers from all over. It's not there anymore because as you all know, newspapers are fading, are you know, Online. being <laughs> um, abandoned. I mean, uh, we're losing our newspapers in this country uh, for the internet. And so I used to go there and raid that store and bring back all these newspapers that I would cut up and put into the work. So I could tell my stories about Native Americans are living everywhere. They're having meetings. 
um, they're having um, you know, conferences and um, there, there are things going on, powwows and well, The beautiful that. thing about using the, um, the text from the Charcusta News too is that it really does, um, it privileges that ev the everyday life that is what is, you know, what you see when you read a local paper. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, national news or conferences, whatever, but it's like, who was born? Who died? Who right. is making a potluck? And who right. is, um, and so I think that that, to me, was something that not until really seeing the works in person came through, because you see how much um, that daily life is being privileged right. and um, emphasized right. in so many right. of the Right, that works. We're, we're living people. Right. And that, you know, um, in, so, oh, oh, in all these 50 years when I've been uh, going out to do lectures at universities and I have audiences, often they would say to me, but I've never met a Native American, or you're the first Native American I've ever met. Um, and I think how sad it is that they don't know that there are Native Americans living right near them or in their community and they're not aware because often we're mistaken for Greek, Italian, Asian, uh, you know, something, but people don't know that we exist. So um, I, I wanted people to know that we're alive and that we're not vanishing, um, like Curtis presented us as the vanishing Americans. Um, that was... I think you make that very clear in a number of works. I have this one up on the screen, which actually is a more recent painting using the map, just again to that idea of the way that your practice is engaged with so many of the same ideas over, uh, over and over and how important it is to sort of return to these ideas and to keep them top of mind. And I particularly love this painting because um, in a way that you sort of very rarely do anywhere else, you were you're centering yourself in something important to you here in where you're placing homeland. And um, to me, that makes this painting particularly poignant because uh, if you know Jean, you know that everyone else sort of comes first. So um, to have yourself uh, there feels very powerful. It was that um, I used the Doppler effect on this map and um, you know, and then surrounded the reservation is the homeland. And um, yeah, it was personal. Yeah. Oh, maps. <laughs> I mean, uh, flags as well. Yeah. Another um, art historic trope, I think, that you um, make wholly your own. Um, but I also wanted to talk about the canoes because it feels like it's one of the most um, sort of important of these iconic images that you use throughout the work. And um, you've used it in paintings, in drawings, in prints, and, and more recently, uh, and increasingly in sculptures in three-dimensional form. And I have heard you talk about the various reasons that the canoe is important. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about how the canoe how it carries your politics, how it carries your activism, your storytelling, and why it feels like an important um, image to use. Well, you know, in doing research, um, you know, I work a lot with my son, Neil Ambrose Smith, and who's also an artist and professor, um, taught at the Indian College in Santa Fe, IAA. IAA. And, um, it, you know, he does his own painting. And, uh, but sometimes when we work together, like we worked on the canoe that appears in this exhibition, um, that canoe, and, um, um, and then we painted it red um, for making medicine because it, like at home they use red ochre, like for ceremonies, um, we would, um, the medicine people would put red ochre around our wrists, on our cheeks and our forehead. Um, and also I had read that in the spring of the year, uh, a tribe in Nova Scotia would paint the house red and paint the baby and paint the musical instruments and, like with red ochre. 
And so, um, so I had that idea that we needed to do that. But the canoe uh, was a conveyor of not just um, like, you know, row, row, row your boat down the stream. It, it really connected the Americas from Patagonia uh, or, uh, to Point Barrow to um, the Atlantic to the Pacific. And Neil and I were doing a research project recently for St. Louis in which uh, I was commissioned to do a painting and a canoe. And in the research we discovered that when we took a map of the Americas, you could take a canoe from Alaska all the way down the Americas. There was a way to um, take a canoe and portage in a canoe and portage and you could move goods or people, uh, trade, um, which St. Louis was a major trading area for all of our tribes in the Americas. And things came from South America uh, to St. Louis and then from St. Louis uh, by canoe because we didn't have oxen or horses. Um, we, we just had dogs and we had canoes. And so in this project, we also discovered that the great bison belt and the bison went in huge herds from Alaska all the way all over both coasts of the United States all the way to Mexico. And we were like really startled at discovering that and creating a map with the bison to show how, how and somebody said in part of the research that we were doing that you could stand for three days and see a herd move. Like that many in a herd, there, there were that many bison here. So the canoe has become important in my work because um, also the canoe used to come up river, up the Mississippi, up the Missouri, to the reservation and bring smallpox blankets, which was one of the world's first uh, germ warfare was to, in the genocide, to get rid of us. Oh, that's me. Um, to get rid of us and um, in, in the genocide, the smallpox blankets was just one way to do that. And so wormy beef, moldy flour, uh, whiskey laced with lead, those were all things that were traded in the trade canoes because they were using our canoes to come up river uh, and to take the land. So part of our history in this country isn't told this way. And so I've been doing, working with the canoes and the stories about the canoes and doing the 3D canoes now um, with um, laden with different kinds of things. Like right now, we're working on a canoe that's got banned books in it. It's filled with banned books. <laughs> Yeah, I love thinking about um, this canoe making medicine in particular as sort of um, you looking back at this work 30 years later, the sort of right. trade gifts for trading land with white people that, that is about the sort of history right. of worms and food and um, smallpox blankets. And this canoe mm -hmm. contains, you know, single-use plastics and fast food containers and right. syringes. And it's it, this is the sort of... the 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 effects of that earlier trade and the idea right. of trading it back. Right. Um, I feel like one of the other things that really has, sticks with me often when you talk about using the canoes is how you see yourself as an artist, as a sort of continuation of that history of trade. That as an artist, you are um, trading in ideas and that right. that is as valid as trading in goods. Um, right. And so, I love how these sort of move into the future in that way through your work. Well, uh, one is about enlightening people. One is about changing systems. One is about invading the systems and the institutions in this country. And then also, um, you know, uh, you know cr creating a new platform for information to get out and doing it, like inside the museum is not always the place that you expect to find it. And so, I always like the idea of what we call at home is called sneak up. And it's about the idea of coming in and surprising somebody. Um, you know, we have these coyote stories about sneak up. And so um, it's that 
you, you wouldn't find this information inside of a museum. And often when you see my work from a distance, you see a flag or you see a canoe, but then when you get up close to it, there's a sneak up, there's a surprise uh, with the information. And so in this one, uh, in this canoe, it sort of looks like a freighter that's been patched. But I made it as a canoe for the North Pole because I was reading about the fact that the, you know, the glaciers are melting and um, that you know, it, the climate is warming so much. I was thinking, okay, if you loaded a canoe with things that, would, you, know, that you could use there, maybe you could use horses and palm trees and you know, things like that. So I, I have a lot of stuff loaded in this canoe. Um, you know, there's, um, uh, there's glass up there that you could make a greenhouse and um, it's loaded with people and, and there are um, there's some interesting little commentaries that, uh, that you would find when you look at it up close, which this one's in the exhibition. Yeah, upstairs. Um, something that you've also really impressed upon me in the years of working together is, um, is your attention to and respect for and sort of sharing of the power of women as political and community and family leaders. And um, this comes through in, in a lot of different aspects of your work, particularly when you're using the sort of image of the flat head dress. But I thought maybe you'd like to say a little bit about the sort of importance of matriarchal power, what it has meant to you and, and why it finds its way into your work or how. Well, like in the African-American community, when you have impoverished people, um, uh, families don't always stay together, but the woman often, you know, has the job of raising the children with or without jobs <clears throat> and, and with difficulty. So in, you know, in the work that I do, um, I, I could say um, I've broken the buckskin ceiling in a number of places, but, but one of them was with the College Art Association when I was appointed to uh, the board and you're not appointed, you're actually voted on by your peers across the United States. So it was the first native um, to become uh, uh, on the board of uh, trustees. And I remember listening to, this is in the mid 90s, listening to the people on the board talking about being raised and their parents taking them on trips to Europe to see the museums. And um, shortly after that, I went home for a women's conference and the women were talking about, uh, I won't be able to pay my rent next month. Um, I, you know, I have two children, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And at the women's conference, there were all kinds of stories like this about survival. And when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of laws, you know, um, you, the, you know, the main part of our native community is still you know, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of laws and at a survival level. And so in doing the work that I do, especially with that first um, Women of Sweetgrass exhibition, you know, women were struggling all the time and didn't have the means to, you know, buy art supplies, um, you know, to uh, do their careers. And also, most of the women were working at the kitchen table because they were cooking at the same time that they were making art. So that isn't what you would find in the white community. It wasn't uh, mainly like that in the white community. And so my, my life has been composed of going back and forth and um, carrying messages back and forth. But the work in, that I do in the uh, tribal community often is involved with just everything at a survival level. And um, uh, it's been really important to keep my feet on the ground and uh, uh, keep my head level. I'm glad that you mentioned the women of Sweetgrass. Um, Cedar and Sage is such an important moment for you and for thinking about um, women makers because we haven't touched on it really yet, but it's so 
such an important aspect of your work, the curatorial practice. And I think that um, that's a great sort of early example. And I was um, thinking, actually, you were talking about being in conversation with the um, great indigenous curator, Candace Hopkins. Um, and she wrote in the catalog about your how foundational your curatorial practice was for her own, but also as sort of really creating an ecosystem for, um, for contemporary Native American art. Um, and I know you and I have talked a lot about this because at the same time that we were organizing your exhibition or the exhibition of your work, you were quite busy. Uh, working on a curatorial project. And you mentioned, Terry mentioned, you mentioned the show at the National Gallery, but for the, for the first time ever, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. invited an artist to participate in a curatorial uh, project and, um, and invited an indigenous artist to, um, to have a, a sort of say in what, was, what the exhibition was. And I think that um, that's, something that was made possible by this very long and strong history of curating, but I am curious to um, hear what you think about the sort of, the work that you were doing back in the 80s, sort of building this ecosystem and how you feel about where the ecosystem is. Well, you know, there now. weren't opportunities for natives to show. And I remember when I organized a group called the Great Canyon, the, a group of artists that I met at the university in the community. And uh, we were all, you know, making art from our own experiences. Um, it wasn't just art that you learned from your tribe, but you were taking that and transposing it into your new life and, um, you know, at university. And so when I began knocking on doors, at local museums and galleries asking if we could do a, a native show of contemporary art. And they would say, what is that? And I said, well, we're artists that, you know, are graduated from university or, um, you know, soon to graduate. And we're making art that is a little different than the art that you would see at Indian Market. In other words, uh, just beadwork or weaving or baskets, um, but it's painting and drawing. And, they would say, well, I don't really know what that is. And so we had a hard time. But I, I found like something like 13 venues one summer. Um, churches, banks, I just went everywhere that um, would allow us to hang the art uh, that we were making. And um, so uh, Larry Emerson called our group the Great Canyon because for the city, the concrete of the city streets and sidewalks and buildings. And there were maybe about six of us. And one time I was in Wisconsin doing a lecture and um, an Indian guy was in the audience and he said, like how many um, natives are in your group? Like 200 or 300? And I said, no, there are about six of us on a good day and sometimes less. <laughs> And he said, you know, your reputation has gone far and wide in the Indian community because it was so hard. Natives were being turned down by galleries or museums and not allowed to participate. So my, my whole thrust in doing this work and moving these exhibitions out of New Mexico was so that people could see that Native people were making wonderful work and of course, one of the most um, well-known is Emmy Whitehorse, who is there in the Great Canyon. I was gonna say, and I've heard her quoted talking about the way that people responded to her work and your work at the time that like, right. this can't be Please. Indian work. There are no, no feathers, there are no beads. No. That, no. You know, it wasn't just about, there were so many hurdles to sort of get over yeah. in people's understanding of um, not just contemporary, but contemporary art made by Native Americans. So, yeah. um, there aren't too many feathers or beads in the exhibition at the National Gallery. No, no. I mean, there's silk screen and sculpture and video and photography, um, paintings, oh, you know, a whole gamut. Well, Lithography. 
I wanted to <clears throat> sort of just sit and end on this painting going forward, looking back, um, because I feel like one of the most crucial takeaways from the exhibition, um, from your show, is really the, the sort of broad belief that one has to know and learn and understand and respect history to be able to imagine new futures. And I feel like that's what um, art allows us to do, is mm -hmm. to imagine new futures. And so I wanted to sort of end with this image up there to think about it. It also happens to be the work that opens this show. Um, but I think that we can take questions, is that right? Are we yeah. timing-ish wise? Um, but before we take questions, I just, um, I just want to thank you for being here, Jean. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I need to thank Laura, too, for this great honor. Uh, thank the museum. Thank Terry. Um, because I, I'm most honored to be here with you. And this has been a long journey for the two of us together. Um, you know, she's just a young sprout, and you know, I'm sort of an elder. And for us in the beginning, uh, you know, we didn't know how this was going to work out, how we would work together. And it's become a, a really nice friendship. Um, she'll be in my life for the rest of my life um, uh, because I'm devoted to her scholarship and the care that she put into this and what, a, what an incredible job she did in putting the exhibition together. I've heard nothing but positive reviews and we garnered like 30, 40 art journals, newspapers. I mean, it was vast. In all the 50 years, I often did shows in, in New York with no critical writing whatsoever. And this show brought them out of the woodwork. And so her job, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. I want her to thank, yeah. Purposes. If somebody has a question, I'll come to you. Does somebody have a question? Want to get us started? Mm -hmm. You guys are going to be shy. Oh, back here. Okay. No, I'm going to come to you. Okay. Yeah. This is my. This is my. Get my steps in this way. I'm going to try really hard to make you cry, though. I promise. Okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Um, no, that's. I was just going to say, I feel like your paintings have a strong sort of sense of conviction to them. And I feel that I can kind of see that in my head in your studio. And I was just going to ask, is there any sort of practice or building to that sort of conviction? Or is it something that comes naturally? Are there any sort of things which you employ in the studio to get to that point? You know, I, I think y you don't, uh, you're not really concentrating on that. I think you're, you're really concentrating on the story, or I am, the story I want to tell. And so I get focused on that. And then, you know, I don't think about all the other things. Um, and of course, I think the older you get, your concentration takes different forms. Um, you know, sometimes I start out by doing some email and then I clean some brushes and then I move into the zone, I call it, you know. Um, so um, every artist has their, you know, their route to getting into the zone to, to where you actually do the work. And you're not always, I'm not always focused on, I, I think have a big picture in my head of like right now I have in the studio, um, a 270-foot canoe, um, which is the biggest I've I've painted, and um, I think when you're going into something like that, 
you're, tr you're scrambling trying to think about how am I going to fill this space. But you just go in and you start doing something and then, you know, it, it seems to flow. You step back and you go forward and you step back. Uh, so um, it's like a mural right now, the thing I'm working on. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Did I? Like. Um, just two quick questions. Uh, sure. First, uh, what uh, I've been to Salish Nations up in the Pacific Northwest. It's a beautiful part of the country, magnificent, frankly. Um, yeah. What what led you to move to New Mexico? It's a simple question, I guess. And then the second question, you probably covered this in the exhibition catalog, but I haven't read it yet. So, uh, uh, and then the second question is: Are there any artists that you can point to who were influences in your career? Yeah. So I'll take the first one. Uh, I came there because I started looking for graduate schools with really good native studies because I wanted to do a dual degree. And it was really important to me to have a Native American studies. Um, at that time, just like in the 60s, out of guilt, uh, institutions were um, repaying BIPOC people uh, with these different departments. They're gone now, and now they've put them all together, lumped them together in oh, something called gender studies and other things. The universities are putting them together that way. But at that time, it was payback, and they were giving back to the communities of color. So I actually had some choices, and I picked the University of New Mexico because um, they had a really good uh, literature teacher, um, and um, a really they had really good courses that uh, that I took while I was taking uh, fine art. I was also taking Native American studies. That's why I went there and why I did that, uh, and how I wound up in New Mexico. Because then I started teaching at the Albuquerque Indian School in Albuquerque teaching high school there. And then I also wanted to teach at the Institute of Indian Arts. I, so I became part of the board of trustees. And then later, my son went to teach there, Neil Ambrose Smith, who's here with us. Uh, so, you know, that kind of began my community and my attachment to that area because there was so much going on. But uh, at the same time, we were always going back home. Um, I, in fact, I bought a house there uh, that I had for a while, um, and I still think about doing that. So I could travel back and forth, uh, That's, but it's hard to get out in the wintertime. I have t a lot of travel, teaching and lecturing, and so getting out of the Missoula airport is hard in the winter. So that's a reason like, that's made it difficult for me to do that. Second question you asked me uh, was about artists, and I look at everything. I mean, Picasso said, you know, take what you need, steal it. Um, I look at folk art, I look at native art, um, you know, I look at art around the world uh, of other cultures. And if you're asking me about, um, you know, the old white men that I had to study in school, uh, I steal everything. And so, <laughs> yeah. So in Fort Worth, we, well here in Texas, we have three reservations, but in Fort Worth, we're hours away from any of them. I think the closest is the Alabama Cachada. And even then, I think some of the Oklahoma reservations are closer. And we're definitely a place where I think people will say, I've never met a Native person, whether they know it or not. And so I wonder, in this particular place, with this particular audience, if there's anything that you hope that people take from this exhibit. Yes, there is. I, I really, two things. One is that we're still here and that we're alive. That, that's my first mission, is um, for people to understand that we're still here. And secondly, I always um, want to be a mentor to any other Native artists that are there. If I've cracked this door, I want you to come through. OK, 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, here we go. Laura Liz didn't get to this one, but we have a horse right here. Could you talk about the impact and importance of horses for you? I think that question's actually for you, but no, no, I didn't. For John. Uh, the importance of horses. I think we have, we didn't talk about that as sort of an iconic image in your work, but we saw, oh. we saw an actual horse in a picture oh. as well. Oh, because my dad was a horse trader, so, um, and he always told me that he could ride a horse before he could walk. Um, you know, horses were all around us. Uh, one year on our five acres, I think we had something like 50 head of horses that I had to help my dad feed and water, uh, walk horses, clean corrals and barns. I mean, I grew up smelling like a horse. Uh, <laughs> and um, I can just tell you that I was never the horseman that my dad was. So he would get on a horseback and he would want to drive horses into the corral and he would tell me and my sister to stand over here and make sure they didn't come this direction and turn. And he would yell at us, you know, standing on the ground with these horses thundering at us, um, and then yell at me if I didn't stop them. Like, <laughs> so it was, was not an easy childhood with him. But yeah, that's how I know horses. <laughs> ah. That was beautiful. Thank you so much to both of you. This was so generous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.